So this is the chapter 12 activity to go over uh, some of the concepts covered in the neuro tissue chapter. So part one, bad fish. One evening during a recent trip to Indonesia, Dr. Marshall Westwood from the Montana Technical Institute sat down to a meal of puffer fish and rice. Within an hour of returning to his hotel room, Dr. Westwood felt numbness in his lips and tongue, which quickly spread to his face and neck. Before he could call the front desk, he began to feel pains in his stomach and throat, which produced feelings of nausea and eventually severe vomiting. Fearing that he had eaten some bad fish for dinner, Dr. Westwood called a local hospital to describe his condition. The numbness in his lips and face made it almost impossible for him to communicate, but the hospital staff managed to at least understand the address he gave them, and they sent an ambulance in response. As Dr. Westwood was rushed to the hospital, his breathing became increasingly difficult. Luckily, Dr. Westwood was treated in time and he made a satisfactory recovery. After discussing his case with his physician, he learned that he had probably been the, been the victim of a pufferfish poisoning. The active toxin in the tissues of this fish is a chemical called tetrodotoxin, TTX. TTX is in a class of chemicals known as neurotoxins due to the fact that it has effects on neurons. Specifically, TTX blocks voltage-gated sodium channels in neurons. And this is actually uh, based on actual incidences that occur when people eat a dish called fugu. It is a type of puffer fish, um, and chefs that prepare it have to be specially certified to make sure that they only take uh, parts of the fish that do not contain the toxin. And oftentimes when untrained people try to prepare this dish, uh, it can result in fatal results. So number one, describe the structure of a neuron and discuss what events take place in each part of the neuron. So I normally draw a little cartoon neuron on the whiteboard if I'm in the classroom, but we'll use this little clip art drawing of a neuron to label the different parts. So first we have the dendrites. These receive messages. They can have little extensions called spines that increase the surface area. Then you also have the cell body, also known as the soma, which contains organelles and performs normal cell functions. And this is also a part of the neuron that can receive messages. So in fact, the dendrites and cell body together are part of what's called the receiving region. This is the area of the neuron where you would have graded potentials. And this is also where you would find ligand-gated ion channels and mechanically-gated ion channels because both of these types of channels lead to graded potentials. Then we also have the axon hillock, which is where the cell body meets the axon. This contains the initial segment. This is where the summation of graded potentials happens and the place where action potentials are generated. Then we have the axon itself, which is the site of action potential propagation. Some axons are covered in myelin, which acts as insulation for faster action potential transmission. And the axon hillock and the axon, and then the myelin if it's present, all compose the conducting region of a neuron. This is where you actually find the action potentials, and this is where you have voltage-gated channels, which are necessary for an action potential. And then at the far end of the neuron, you have the synaptic terminals, and this is the site where the neuron talks to other cells. So this is the output region where you have the synaptic communication, where the neurotransmitters are released and they cross the synaptic cleft. And you will also have voltage-gated channels here, um, both potassium and sodium voltage-gated channels to allow for action potentials and voltage-gated calcium channels which allow for neurotransmitter release. Number two, how does a voltage-gated channel work? How does this channel differ from ligand-gated channels and mechanically-gated channels? So voltage-gated channels open and closed based on changes to the membrane potential. Some of these channels, like voltage-gated sodium channels, actually have a second gate, 
called an inactivation gate. So they have a main gate and a second gate. So let's look at two of the voltage gated channels that are important for action potentials. So the voltage gated sodium channel has three different states. It can be closed, open, or inactivated. It closes at a resting membrane potential, negative 70 millivolts. Again, remember that these channels are opening and closing based on changes to the membrane potential. So they open when the membrane potential depolarizes to negative 50 to negative 60 millivolts. This allows sodium ions to cross the membrane. They become inactivated at positive 30 millivolts, and when inactivated, sodium cannot cross, just like it can't cross when it's closed. And then from inactivated, these channels have to go to the closed state before they can reopen. So they have to go through this series of steps, closed, open, and activated. Voltage-gated potassium channels only have two states. They are closed, and they close around resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. And from closed, they can open at positive 30 millivolts. And when they're open, this allows potassium ions to leave the cell. And then from the open state, they can go back to being closed. So they only have the two states. And just for your information, voltage-gated calcium channels work very similar to voltage-gated potassium channels. So the second part of the question was, how does this channel differ from ligand-gated channels and mechanically-gated channels? So again, remember, voltage-gated channels are based on changes to the membrane potential. And these other channel types have different kinds of gates. In other words, the gates are opened or closed by something other than a membrane potential change. So with ligand-gated channels, they open or close based on the binding of a specific molecule, which we call a ligand, and neurotransmitters are ligands. So in this example, we have a channel here on the left that is open when the neurotransmitter is bound to it, and it is closed when the neurotransmitter is not present. So that is a ligand-gated channel. And then mechanically gated channels open or close based on distortions to the plasma membrane. So if pressure or distortion is applied to the plasma membrane, that forces the channel open. And then when the cell is hanging out as normal, the channel is closed. So these channels all differ in the way that their gates work. Voltage gated channels are gated by changes in membrane potential. Ligand gated channels are based on whether or not something binds to it. Mechanically gated channels open or closed based on distortions to the plasma membrane. Little bonus question for you. What do all three of these types of channels have in common? All of these channels, the voltage gated, ligand gated, and mechanically gated, all allow for the passive diffusion of an ion down its electrochemical gradient. So none of these are active transport. They are all passive transport involving diffusion. Number three, explain where in a neuron would you expect to find the highest concentration of voltage-gated sodium channels and why? So you would expect to find the highest concentration of voltage-gated sodium channels in the axon and the synaptic terminals. The axon is where the action potential is generated, specifically at the axon hillock, and then it is propagated down the length of the axon, which means that it has to be regenerated at each subsequent section of the axon. Action potentials are also required at the synaptic terminals in order to open voltage-gated calcium channels, which allows for the excitosis of the neurotransmitter. In axons with myelin sheaths, Voltage-gated sodium channels would be located in the nodes of Ranvier between the myelin sheaths. So bottom line, voltage-gated sodium channels are required for an action potential to occur. So you would need voltage-gated sodium channels anywhere you need to have an action potential, which is the axon and the synaptic terminals. Question four. Why do sodium ions need channels to move into and out of cells? How are sodium ions normally distributed with regards to the cell and extracellular fluid? 
Is sodium flow through voltage-gated channels an active process or a passive process? So for the first part of the question, sodium ions have a positive charge. And if you remember from chapter three, only small hydrophobic molecules can move through the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane. Since sodium ions are charged, they are definitely not hydrophobic. So they require protein channels in order to pass through the plasma membrane. For the second part of the question, sodium ion concentration is low inside the cell and high outside of the cell in the extracellular fluid. And to answer the last part of the question, sodium flow through a voltage-gated ion channel is a passive process, meaning no energy is required because sodium moves down its electrochemical gradient, so sodium moves from the outside to the inside down its gradient. Number five, what is the resting membrane potential of a neuron? What processes are responsible for maintaining this resting potential? Which ion contributes most to the resting membrane potential? So the resting membrane potential of a neuron is typically negative 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential is a result of two factors. First, you have the passive leak of potassium ions through potassium leak channels, and they leak out of the cell. And you also have the passive leak of sodium ions through sodium leak channels. They leak into the cell. And the reason they leak in these directions is because of their gradients, and they're moving down their electrochemical gradient. The second factor is you have the active pumping by the sodium-potassium pump of sodium ions back to the outside of the cell and potassium ions back to the inside of the cell. And this is in order to maintain the gradients so that the leaks can keep occurring. So remember, sodium-potassium pump uses ATP, which makes this an active process. So together, those two factors determine the resting membrane potential of the neuron. Potassium contributes the most to the resting membrane potential because there are far more potassium leak channels than there are sodium leak channels. So the resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts is closer to potassium's equilibrium potential of negative 90 millivolts than it is to sodium's equilibrium potential of positive 66 millivolts. So there are far more potassium leak channels, so potassium plays a larger role in determining the resting membrane potential. Question number six. Imagine touching your lips with the end of your pen. Describe the processes from beginning to end involved in how your brain is going to learn that a part of your body was touched. Start with the stimulus and end with the postsynaptic potential in the neuron going to the CNS. You should discuss the first graded potential, the, the action potential, the synaptic communication, and the second graded potential. Okay, so I've sketched out a rough diagram of the cells that are involved. So we have our lips over here that we're touching with the pen. As you'll learn uh, next semester, the lips have, as well as all of your skin, has touch receptors in it that are connected to sensory neurons. So I have a sensory neuron here in the middle, and sensory neurons are unipolar. So I've shown that by drawing the cell body with one extension. The dendrites are over here. These are going to be where the, the touch receptors are on the lips. So that's picking up or receiving the information. Then I have my axon. I have my synaptic terminal. And then I have another neuron. This would be the central nervous system neuron that is in the spinal cord and it's going to carry the information up to the brain. And then these are the dendrites of the CNS neuron. So let's follow through and see how this message goes from you touching your lips to getting the information to the brain. So the first step is the touch receptors on the dendrites of the sensory neuron are gonna be activated and this will give us our first graded potential. So let's look at this in more detail. The touch of the pin is gonna distort the plasma membrane of the receptors in the lip and this is going to open mechanically gated sodium channels. 
So remember, mechanically gated sodium channels open with the distortion of a plasma membrane. So over here on the left, we have the cell at rest. Our membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. We're looking at the sensory dendrite, so the dendrite on the sensory neuron. Remember, sodium is low on the inside of the cell and high on the outside of the cell. And then when my pen touches my lip, right, that is going to actually distort the plasma membrane of those cells. That is going to cause uh, mechanically gated sodium channels to open. Sodium will rush into the cell, and this is going to cause a depolarization. So my membrane potential became more positive. The amount of depolarization I get is going to depend on how many ion channels got opened. So if I touch a very light touch, I'm only opening a few ion channels. If I really bang the pen on my lips, I'm going to be opening a lot more ion channels. And the amount of depolarization is also going to depend on how long those channels stay open for. And so all of these factors mean that I can get different levels of depolarization, and that is why we call this a graded potential. So the amount of depolarization I get is actually going to depend on things like the strength of the stimulus. If the depolarization is large enough to reach threshold potential, then I will get an action potential. Okay, so back to our drawing. We just looked at the first graded potential. So now we're going to look at the action potential. So if the threshold was reached with the graded potential, an action potential is going to be generated. So here is my little graph. So we started out at resting potential of negative 70. Then we had that graded potential in the dendrites of the sensory neuron. So that graded depolarization raised my membrane potential up in the positive direction, as shown here. If that graded depolarization was large enough to hit threshold, then an action potential will be generated. So here's where the action potential starts. At threshold, the voltage-gated sodium channels open, and sodium rushes into the cell, depolarizing it rapidly, and this is called the depolarization phase. At 30 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate and the voltage-gated potassium channels open. Potassium then rushes out of the cell causing rapid repolarization, and this is called the repolarization phase. At resting potential at negative 70 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channels close and the voltage-gated potassium channels start to close. Potassium continues to move out of the cell while the voltage-gated potassium channels are closing, resulting in a brief hyperpolarization called the hyperpolarization phase. Now all voltage-gated channels are closed and leak channels and the sodium-potassium pump returns the membrane back to the resting potential. So that is the generation of the action potential. So again, if I look again at my uh, overview drawing up here, we've had the first graded potential that led to an action potential. Now let's look at the action potential being propagated down the length of the axon. So the action potential is regenerated in each adjacent section of the axon. So the depolarization that occurs during the depolarization phase of the action potential, which we looked at on the previous slide, spreads to the next section of membrane or to the next node of Ranvier in a myelinated axon. So I've got two axons here because I'm going to show you the two types of propagation. So at the top where it says continuous, this is an unmyelinated axon. So it's showing the action potential started in the initial segment and the depolarization from the action potential spread over to the next section of membrane. With a myelinated axon, I get a type of propagation called a saltatory propagation. The action potential still starts in the initial segment, but the depolarization caused by the action potential actually will spread very quickly because of the insulation of the myelin to the next node of Ranvier, which is the space between the myelin sheaths. So when the next section or node reaches threshold, the action potential is regenerated. 
So once the depolarization reaches this section of the membrane, I get a whole new action potential in this section of the membrane. Same thing with my myelinated neuron. Once the depolarization reached this node of Ranvier, I get an entire new action potential at this node. And this happens again. The depolarization spreads to the next area and I get another action potential. Same thing with the myelinated axon. It spreads to the next node and I get another action potential. But notice that these X's that I'm putting behind the action potential, that represents that the action potential does not travel backwards because those voltage-gated sodium channels that we just left behind are still in their absolute refractory period, so they cannot fire a second action potential yet. And this ensures that the movement of the action potential is only one way down the axon. And thus, doing this over and over and over again, the action potential will move from one membrane segment to the next in continuous propagation, as shown on the top, or in a myelinated axon, it will move from one node of Ranvier to the other all the way down the axon, and that is called saltatory propagation. All right, so we just left off with our action potential propagation. The next step is that the information is shared across the synaptic cleft between the sensory neuron and the central nervous system neuron, and this is going to be the synaptic communication. So when the action potential reaches the synaptic terminal, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Calcium rushes into the synaptic terminal and triggers the exocytosis of the vesicles containing neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic membrane, which in this case is the dendrite of the CNS neuron. And in this example, we're considering this to be an excitatory synapse because we want the brain to learn about the sensory information from the pen touching the lips. So we're going to consider this as being an excitatory synapse. That means that the neurotransmitter is going to bind to ligand-gated sodium channels on the postsynaptic membrane and they open. If we wanted this to be an inhibitory synapse, we would be using potassium channels instead. So because we open sodium channels, sodium rushes into the postsynaptic dendrite, causing depolarization. Meanwhile, reuptake channels and or enzymes are removing the neurotransmitter from the cleft, and it depends on the specific neurotransmitter. We already talked in Chapter 10 about how acetylcholine is removed with the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, but other neurotransmitters like serotonin use little pumps called reuptake pumps that pump the neurotransmitter back into the synaptic cleft. I mean, sorry, back into the uh, presynaptic terminal. Okay, so now we have just finished the synaptic communication, and this has resulted in a graded potential in the dendrite of the CNS neuron. So this is my second graded potential. So as we just mentioned, the ligand-gated ion channels that were opened by the neurotransmitter allowed sodium to rush into the postsynaptic cell, which in this case is this dendrite of the CNS neuron. The amount of depolarization depends on how many ligand-gated sodium channels were open, and that depends on how much neurotransmitter was released. So again, the degree of depolarization depends on the strength of the stimulus. So again, this is what we call a graded potential. If the depolarization is large enough to reach threshold, an action potential will be generated. So hopefully this is starting to sound familiar because this is how we started way over here. So basically, you have these processes, graded potential, action potential, which propagates synaptic communication, and then another graded potential. And these processes repeat over and over again. And this is how messages actually travel throughout the nervous system. So it's basically you have a graded potential, right, at some location. It could be a receptor. It could be in the dendrite of a neuron. But you have a graded potential, which leads to an action potential if it gets to threshold which then leads to synaptic communication at the end of the neuron, 
which then you're going to cross the synaptic cleft and create a graded potential in the next neuron, which if you get a depolarization high enough to hit threshold, you get an action potential, which is then propagated down the length of the axon of that second neuron, which then leads to synaptic communication at the synaptic terminals of that next neuron, which then crosses the synaptic cleft and you get a graded potential in the next neuron. And then again, if your graded potential is depolarizing enough to get threshold, you get an action potential in that neuron, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. So this is the same process is over and over and over again, and this is how messages are transmitted around the nervous system. Number seven, using the process that you described in number six, explain why Dr. Westwood experienced numbness of his lips after eating the puffer fish meal. So here's our diagram from question number six, where we showed the different processes that lead to Dr. Westwood being able to feel, or in this case, not feel his, his lips. So remember that the um, underlying cause of Dr. Westwood's numbness was that he ingested tetrodotoxin or TTX. And we mentioned in the original question that TTX blocks voltage-gated sodium channels. And without voltage-gated sodium channels, you cannot get an action potential. So if you go back and look at these different processes, you'll notice that to get the action potential, you have to have voltage-gated sodium channels. So the TTX is going to block a neuron from being able to generate an action potential. So the action potential in the sensory neuron could never be generated, shown by the X, so the brain is never going to get the message about the sensory information coming from the lips. So basically this entire message pathway got stopped right here. And numbness is actually a lack of sensory information. So when a part of your body feels numb, that means the brain is not getting any sensory information from that area for one, for one reason or another. In this case, the reason was the TTX blocking the voltage-gated sodium channels. Number eight, Dr. Westwood also experienced paralysis, a term used to describe the loss of function of muscle. If tetrodotoxin affects neurons, then why did Dr. Westwood experience paralysis? Well, hopefully you haven't forgotten chapter 10, and we talked about the neuromuscular junction and how muscles get the signal to contract from a motor neuron that is forming synapses with them. So remember that skeletal muscles don't contract unless they get a signal from a motor neuron. Well, tetrodotoxin, or TTX, is going to block voltage-gated sodium channels in all neurons. So it's going to block them in motor neurons as well as the sensory neurons that we looked at on the previous slide. So without functioning voltage-gated sodium channels, the motor neuron will not be able to generate an action potential. So again, our blockage is at the ability to generate an action potential down the axon. So therefore, the muscle is never going to get a signal telling it to contract, and that is going to be the cause of the paralysis. Now, if you also thought about the action potentials that, that take place in the muscle cells, that would have been a valid answer as well. So TTX could also block the generation of an action potential in the sarcolemma. So if you remember from chapter 10 at the neuromuscular junction, after you get depolarization at the motor end plate, if the depolarization reaches threshold, you get an action potential in the muscle cell itself. It travels along the sarcolemma and down into the T tubules, and this is necessary for the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So yes, voltage-gated sodium channels would also block that function of the muscle as well. It's just that the muscle would actually never get the signal to even start any of these processes because the motor neuron is going to be blocked first. Number nine, describe the differences between sensory and motor neurons, and then describe the organization of the nervous system, showing which divisions the sensory neurons and motor neurons belong to. So sensory neurons typically have a unipolar structure, like we drew in our previous slides, where you have a cell body with only one extension, 
And then at the end of that long extension, you'll have the dendrites and then the axon or synaptic terminals on the other end. Motor neurons typically have a multipolar structure, which is how you typically see uh, clip art and other random pictures of neurons drawn. Sensory neurons also carry sensory information from the periphery up to the brain, whereas motor neurons carry commands from the brain down to the periphery. So sensory neurons can also be called ascending and motor neurons can be called descending. So let's look at the second part of the question about the divisions of the nervous system. So the overall nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is everywhere else outside of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is further subdivided into the afferent and efferent divisions. The afferent division is where you're going to find your sensory neurons. Your efferent division is where you're going to find your motor neurons. The efferent division can further be subdivided into the somatic and autonomic divisions. The somatic division are commands going to skeletal muscles. The autonomic division is commands going to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. And then the autonomic system can further be subdivided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The sympathetic system is your fight or flight and the parasympathetic system is your rest and digest. There is also the enteric nervous system, which is also sometimes considered to be part of the autonomic nervous division. Number 10, another potent neurotoxin called omega conotoxin is found in the marine cone snail. This particular toxin blocks voltage-gated calcium channels. How would you describe this toxin affecting the processes you described in number six. So again, here is our little sketch for number six. Just for your information, there's a little picture of a cone snail. So voltage-gated calcium channels are required for the neurotransmitter to be released from the presynaptic terminal at a synapse. If you go back and review the synaptic communication notes you made, you'll see that the voltage-gated calcium channel has to open to allow calcium to come in to allow neurotransmitter to be exocytosed into the synaptic cleft. So without voltage-gated calcium channels, you could not get synaptic communication. So the next neuron down here could never get a signal and it could never produce a graded potential, so it could never generate an action potential. Number 11, Marotoxin, MTX, is a neurotoxin secreted by a specific species of scorpion. MTX blocks voltage-gated potassium channels. How would this toxin affect the processes you described in number six? So again, here's our little drawing, and there's a little picture of a scorpion. Bottom line, almost all of these poisonous animals in nature usually secrete some types of neurotoxin, meaning that their stings will usually... Um, put a neurotoxin that will affect some portion of your nervous system into your body. So stay away from poisonous animals. So in this case, voltage-gated potassium channels are necessary for the repolarization phase of the action potential. So if you go back and review your notes for the action potential, you'll see that the VGPCs are necessary for repolarization and without repolarization, the membrane gets stuck at that positive 30 millivolts potential. So the voltage-gated sodium channel still inactivate, but with this toxin, the voltage-gated potassium channels can't open. So the membrane just stays at the plus 30, and the voltage-gated sodium channels get stuck in their inactivated state. So remember that in order for the voltage-gated sodium channels to reset to the closed position so that they can reopen, the membrane potential has to come back down to negative 70, and it can't do that without the voltage-gated potassium channels. And if the voltage-gated sodium channels can't reopen because they're stuck in the inactivated state, then no more action potentials can be generated.
So you would get a single action potential, and then after that action potential had passed, all of those sodium channels are now stuck in the uh, inactivated state, and the membrane is stuck at plus 30 millivolts, and the neuron would be unable to do anything else. So you can think of it as getting one action potential, and then all of the uh, sodium channels are stuck in a permanent absolute refractory period. Part 2, Tetanus. A 70-year-old male, Mr. Chambers, with a history of diabetes, comes into a minute clinic with a sore throat and a headache. He does not have a fever, but a rapid strep and influenza test are run anyway to rule these out. Both tests were negative. Mr. Chambers is given an antihistamine and sent home. Three days later, his symptoms are still present, and now he is having trouble swallowing. At the urgent care clinic, a doctor notices an ulcer on the bottom of his great toe, which does not surprise him because the patient has been living with uncontrolled diabetes for some time. And we'll talk about uh, diabetes in more detail next semester, but it can impede wound healing. The ulcer is cleaned and dressed and a throat culture is taken. The patient is sent home to await the throat culture results but soon begins to experience neck stiffness and back spasms. When his family notices that he has started drooling, sweating, and becoming overall more irritable, they take him to the emergency room. Further testing reveals that the man has tetanus. He had been infected by the bacteria Clostridium tetani, which produces a neurotoxin called tetanospamin. C. tetetani is widespread and may even be found in or on soil, manure, dust, clothing, and even skin. However, the spores released by the bacteria need an ideal environment to germinate. The ideal environment in humans is a wound with tissue necrosis, such as the ulcer on the diabetic man's foot. When the neurotoxin reaches the spinal cord, it enters central inhibitory neurons, where it binds to GABA and glycine and causes a loss of inhibition. So number one, look at the diagram of the three nerve cells. At the bottom, there is a postsynaptic cell which receives chemical synapses from the three presynaptic cells, which are shown at the top of the diagram. Two of the presynaptic cells are labeled excitatory, cell A and cell B, and the other is labeled inhibitory. Assume that a single action potential in a presynaptic cell does not produce enough of a graded potential in the postsynaptic cell to, release, to reach threshold. Show how the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell changes if there is one action potential in A, only the excitatory A presynaptic cell, B, only the inhibitory presynaptic cell, or C, both the inhibitory and the excitatory A presynaptic cell. What do we call these resulting membrane changes in the postsynaptic cell? So here is our diagram. So we are looking at this postsynaptic cell here in the middle, and it's getting input from an inhibitory neuron in gray and two excitatory neurons labeled A and B. So the first question asks for, to see what it would look like in the postsynaptic cell if it only got a signal from the single excitatory A neuron. So that means the excitatory A neuron had an action potential and released a neurotransmitter, which opened sodium channels on the postsynaptic cell. And so we would get a small depolarization. So there would be a slight depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. And we know it's a depolarization because we were told that this is an excitatory synapse. And this little uh, graded potential shown here is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP. Now this part B asks to see what would happen if only the inhibitory neuron sent a signal. So now because this is an inhibitory neuron, it is releasing a neurotransmitter that opens like say potassium channels on the postsynaptic cell and that's going to cause the postsynaptic cell to undergo hyperpolarization. So if we were to draw that, it would look like this. We start at minus 70 and we have a small hyperpolarization. So there would be a slight hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. 
and this is called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential or IPSP. Now the last question said what would it look like if you got a signal from both the inhibitory neuron and the excitatory A neuron? And here is the answer. This is what it would look like. So why is it flat? Well there would be no change in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic membrane because the EPIP, EPSP and the IPSP cancel each other out. So we're getting a signal, signal from the inhibitory neuron which would cause a slight hyperpolarization and a signal from the excitatory neuron which would cause a slight depolarization and those two cancel each other out which results in no change in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell. Question number two, using the same diagram from number one, demonstrate an example of spatial summation and an example of tem temporal summation. So just to let you know, part C of the previous question also showed an example of spatial summation, so I'm not going to repeat that same example. But if I go back here, this was an example of spatial. Spatial means two different synapses. So we had a synapse with the inhibitory neuron and a synapse with the excitatory A neuron. So two different synapses makes it spatial summation. And the summation part is I add together um, the EPSP and the IPSP to see that they cancel each other out. So now I'm going to give you another example of spatial summation and an example of temporal summation. So a reminder, a single EPSP from either neuron A or B is going to cause a slight depolarization in the potential of the postsynaptic cell. So spatial summation, if both the A neuron and the B neuron send signals at the same time, so I would get an EPSP from the A neuron and an EPSP from the B neuron, and these two EPSPs would be summed together to give a larger depolarization in the postsynaptic membrane. So it would look like this, right? A causes a depolarization and then B at the same time is causing another depolarization. So those two get added together to make a larger depolarization. And in this case, the depolarization should now be large enough to reach threshold and trigger an action potential in my postsynaptic cell. Then if I wanted to give an example of temporal summation, I could say that the A neuron, the A excitatory neuron, sends signals back to back, so boom, boom. Again, it will result in two EPSPs which are summed together, and again, we would get a larger depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So the A would send a signal and I would get a depolarization and then the A would immediately send another signal before the first one has had time to dissipate and I would have an even larger uh, postsynaptic potential in this cell down here. And again, the depolarization should now reach threshold and trigger an action potential. Number three, now show an example of summation if there is an action potential in all three of the presynaptic cells, so inhibitory A and B. What type of summation is this? Would you get an action potential in the postsynaptic cell? If you haven't already tried to figure this out, see if you can figure it out now based on the information I gave you with questions one and two, and pause the video and then come back and check your answer. So, Adding responses from the three different synapses, so we have three different synapses here, inhibitory A and B. This is going to be another example of spatial summation, so over different areas or different spaces. We have two EPSPs and one IPSP, right? So two excitatory inputs and one inhibitory input. So one of the EPSP and, one, and the IPSP are going to cancel each other out, just like we saw in Part C of Question 1. So that takes care of one EPSP and one IPSP. They cancel each other out. That leaves us with just one EPSP. So the answer is it would look like this. You would get a small depolarization in the postsynaptic membrane. And the original question said to assume that a single EPSP is not strong enough to reach threshold. So the answer to the last part of the question is no, there would not 
be an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. Number four, explain the synaptic events that occur when glutamate is the neurotransmitter. Assume that glutamate is working through ionotropic effects at the synapse. So an action potential arrives at the synaptic terminal. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium rushes into the synaptic terminal. The vesicles containing glutamate undergo exocytosis and dump the glutamate into the synaptic cleft. Glutamate diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to ligand-gated sodium channels and they open. Sodium rushes into the postsynaptic cell and causes a graded depolarization. If the depolarization reaches the threshold potential, an action potential is generated. So key take home points from this answer and the question. You should know that glutamate is almost always an excitatory neurotransmitter. Excitatory neurotransmitters cause depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, and that is why I chose to say sodium channels. And because the question said ionotropic, that means that glutamate acted directly by opening the ligand-gated sodium channels. And again, I chose sodium channels because I knew this was excitatory, and I knew that excitatory meant I needed a depolarization. And sodium channels cause sodium to come in, which causes a depolarization. And this is a direct effect because the neurotransmitter binds directly to the ion channels. Number five, explain the synaptic events when GABA or glycine is the neurotransmitter. Assume that GABA glycine is working through metabotropic effects at the synapse. So an action potential arrives at the synaptic terminal. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium rushes into the synaptic terminal. The vesicles containing GABA or glycine undergo exocytosis and dump GABA into the synaptic cleft. So I'm just sticking with GABA for now to make it easier. GABA binds to a G-protein receptor on the postsynaptic membrane, which is not an ion channel. The G-protein initiates a series of metabolic reactions inside the cell, which eventually results in the opening of a potassium ion channel. Potassium will then rush out of the postsynaptic cell and cause a graded hyperpolarization. The postsynaptic cell will now have a harder time generating an action potential because its membrane is now farther away from the threshold potential. It is more negative. So key take home points here are that you should know that GABA and glycine are almost always inhibitory neurotransmitters. So that told me I needed a hyperpolarization and that told me this is going to involve potassium channels. So again, inhibitory neurotransmitters cause hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So I knew that in one way or another, potassium channels were gonna be involved. But because the question said metabotropic, that means that the neurotransmitter acted indirectly by initiating a metabolic pathway that eventually opens channels, but the neurotransmitter itself does not act directly on channels. So this was an example of a metabotropic or indirect method of neurotransmitter action. Now notice you can mix and match these. I could have had glutamate working through a metabotropic effect, or I could have had GABA working through an ionotropic effect. So the key is just knowing the neurotransmitter and whether it's excitatory or inhibitory. That's gonna tell you if it's hyperpolarization or depolarization. That's gonna tell you is it sodium channels or potassium channels. And then the metabotropic and ionotropic tells you if the neurotransmitter binds directly to the ion channel or not. Number six. Using your answers to the questions above, can you explain why the tetanus toxin results in sustained muscle contractions? So this is a painting of a man that has tetanus. So you can see kind of just how horrible this uh, condition really is with all of your muscles undergoing sustained contractions continually. It can be very painful. 
and it is ultimately fatal, and this is why we have a tetanus vaccine. So as mentioned in the intro, the tetanus toxin blocks the release of the neurotransmitters GABA and glycine. And GABA and glycine, as we learned in the previous co uh, question, work to provide inhibitory signals in the central nervous system. And remember, if they are inhibitory, that means that they make it harder for neurons to fire action potentials. So if we consider the answer that we had to number three, remember when we were doing the summation of all of these different inputs into the postsynaptic cell, we looked at the spatial summation of two EPSPs and one IPSP. And if you remember from that question, we got a small depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So one IPSP canceled out with one of the EPSPs, and that left us with one EPSP and a small depolarization, which was not enough to get an action potential. Now imagine that the inhibitory input was blocked, and that is what the tetanus toxin does, is it blocks the inhibitory signals. So if we were to block this inhibitory signal, now we would have two EPSPs. We would not have an IPSP to cancel one of them out. So the two EPSPs would summate and give us a larger graded depolarization, which would be enough to reach threshold and get an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. So in a situation where we normally would not have gotten an action potential, if we add in the tetanus toxin, now we are getting an, act, an action potential. So the bottom line is that without inhibitory signals, there will be too many excitatory postsynaptic potentials in the motor neurons, which would lead to more than normal action potentials. And remember, an action potential in the motor neuron tells your muscles to contract. And so this would lead to the sustained muscle contractions in all of your skeletal muscles called tetanic contractions, which is what makes tetanus so horrible. Number seven, tetanus toxin ultimately results in overactive motor neurons. Motor neurons are myelinated neurons. What type of neuroglia myelinates these neurons? What is the function of myelin? What can cause demyelination, and what are some negative consequences of demyelination? So since motor neurons are part of the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system, we're talking about the peripheral nervous system, so these neurons are myelinated by Schwann cells. Remember that CNS neurons are myelinated by oligodendrocytes. Myelin provides insulation which prevents the leak of the current across the membrane, and this allows for the faster travel of the depolarizing currents. And whenever you see the word current, we're just talking about the movement of the ions and the charges that accompany them. Demyelination can be caused by heavy metal poisoning, bacterial toxins, like in the case of diphtheria, and by autoimmune attacks, such as what happens in multiple sclerosis or Guillain-Barre syndrome. Demyelination greatly reduces the speed of the ac action potential propagation, which compromises the function. So for example, it would make your motor movements very slug sluggish and slow. And in some neurons, the signal fails to propagate at all, because there are no voltage-gated sodium channels between the nodes of Ranvier, so once the myelin is gone, the action potential can actually just fade out and it can't make it all the way down the axon. So without myelin, the axons themselves can also become damaged. And in all three of these cases, you are compromising function and you're not getting signals to where they need to go like you normally would. And last, question number eight, how is an action potential propagated along a myelinated axon versus an unmyelinated axon? So we covered this a little bit earlier in part one, but at, to review, in a myelinated axon, the axon potential jumps from one node of Ranvier to the next, and this is called saltatory propagation. Saltatory means jumping. So the depolarizing current 
from one action potential spreads rapidly underneath the myelin sheaths because of the insulation, and this allows faster propagation of the action potential. So there are two types of myelinated axons. In type A fibers that have a large diameter, action potentials can travel at 120 meters per second, which is 268 miles per hour. And in type B fibers, which have a smaller diameter, action potentials travel at 18 meters per second or 40 miles per hour. Then in an unmyelinated axon, the axon has to move from one membrane area to the next, and we call this continuous propagation. So the action potential has to regenerate along every adjacent section of the membrane, resulting in slower propagation of the action potential. And these types of um, axons are called type C fibers, so they have small diameter and they're unmyelinated. So this is your slowest speed. In these types of axons, action potentials can only travel at one meter per second, which is about two miles per hour. So myelinated axons use saltatory propagation, unmyelinated axons use continuous propagation. And that is the end of the chapter 12 activity.